So this is lecture 29 of ECE 503. And so in today's lecture, we talk about the concept of the quadrature mirror filter banks. So in lecture 28, we talked about filter banks in general. Um, I described about like how to create, for instance, analysis filters, synthesis filters, polyphase representations, uniform filter banks, wavelets, and, and the like. Now what we're going to talk about is this divide and conquer strategy that is really easy to do, and then to come up with filter designs that satisfy this thing called quadrature mirror filters. All right? So what is a quadrature mirror filter bank? So, so far, um, we've only been looking at structures, right? I've only been describing, oh, this is a wavelet, this is a subband coder, this is a transmultiplexer. Look at all how the boxes and the downsampling and the upsampling rates are. And at some point in lecture 28, I talked about perfect reconstruction, right? But I didn't say what perfect reconstruction is mathematically. I just said, oh yeah, when you have this perfect reconstruction, there is no dis distortion at the end of the entire process. When you, let's say, if you decompose a signal using an analysis filter, and, um, and then you reconstitute it using a synthesis filter, you absolutely have no uh, distortion at the end of the day. Your, your filters are chosen just right. But I did not tell all of you how to get that. Right? You're taking my word for it. <sighs> don't believe me. <laughs> just like don't believe me when I'm like busy or something and you say, hey, we're going, right? I say, yeah, yeah, five minutes, five minutes. It's never five minutes. Anyways, um, <laughs> so what happens is we're going to talk about these conditions. We're going to talk about, in this case, in the context of this thing called quadrature mirror filter banks, we'll look at the mathematical conditions that provide, in this case, that perfect reconstruction. Right? So in this case, we're going to choose high pass and low pass filters that meet perfect reconstruction. And there's some specific criteria that we need to look at. So the QMF looks like this. You take a signal and you carve out its high pass and low pass components. You downsample by two. And that's, that's it. So one channel is all high pass frequencies and, or the high frequencies and the other is all low frequencies. And then the synthesis filters just stitch those two guys together and gives you the reconstructed original signal. What I would love to do the reconstructed signal, the y of n, I would love it if it was equal to x of n. That would be cool. So, what we want to do is we want to come up with a way where when we do the analysis filter bank and then the synthesis filter bank, at no point do we have distortion. At no point do we have aliasing. I would love these two guys to perfectly match, and when they were stitched together, voila, you have the original signal from before. And the way you do it is you choose your high pass and low pass filters based off of a single prototype. Okay? So let's say there's this H of Z. Let's say H of Z is the low pass filter, right? In the frequency domain. And the high pass version is equal to h of minus z. And then at the synthesis stages, it's equal to g naught. The low pass version is equal to h of z times 2 because there will be an amplitude change, right, by a factor of 2. And the high pass is equal to the high pass at the analysis filter bank, but multiply by minus 2, okay? And we're going to see what that looks like. So first of all, time domain what does this look like? H0 is equal to Hn. H1 is equal to alternating ones and minus ones multiplied by H of n, the coefficients. That's usually a trick to get your high pass filter from your low pass filter from those coefficients. As for the other guys, the, at the other end, the, other, the, the synthesis filters, again, it's the same thing but with a 2 in front. What is important about QMFs? Why do we call it quadrature mirror filters? They mirror around pi over 2, right? So you have this perfect symmetry between the high-pass and low-pass filters. 
So how do we get these expressions? How do we get this, and why do we have this, per, th th this achieve perfect reconstruction? And the answer is, let's work it out end to end. So what happens is, let's say this reconstructed guy, this reconstructed signal, this, eight, uh, this xz hat, is equal to all of this guy plus all of that guy. So, so uh, let's, let's work backwards, OK? So mm, let's work this out. So where are we getting this from? So we have h naught of z, we have h1 of z, we have down sample, down sample, right? We have x of z, then we have up sample, up sample, so g naught of z g1 of z, okay, and that gives us a reconstructed version of, of x of z, all right? Theoretically, there would be something in the middle here, okay? So this is our analysis filter bank, and this would be our synthesis filter bank, okay? So how about end to end? How does this look like? So what is, so x of z, so what we want to do is essentially uh, we want to create a sort of system of equations. So I know that we're going to have the addition of two components, so a high pass and a low pass component. So let's say the upper branch here is going to be our low pass, uh, sorry, our low frequency component. And this branch here is going to be our high frequency component. So we know that there's going to be some sort of um, process to get from end to end here, okay? So we know that there's going to be a, a g naught of z, and it's going to be multiplied by, by some signal, and it's going to go through the, high, uh, the down sampling and the up sampling process. And then we know that g1 of z is going to do the same thing, and then all of that is going to be multiplied by x of z. So I'm leaving that out for now. We also know that we have this like down sampling and um, up sampling uh, stuff that's going on. So let's let's refer back. Okay, so keep. So we go back here, and what we notice, okay, is uh, so if we solve this end to end, right? What we what we've got, okay is first of all, this is desired, and that's desired. So we're, we're going to have those two contributions. But we're also, what we're going to get as well, is we're going to get this guy. We're going to get kind of like cross terms as well, both at, uh, uh, at, in both the low and high frequency components. And you might say, well, how, how, do, how, how come? Why? Think about it. We're downsampling. So we're throwing away information. And then we're upsampling. Right, so th then we're inserting zeros. So that is going to play a role. Right. So how how did we get that? What this is is actually it's aliasing terms. Right. So so these guys here are are grouped together because um, they're from from the periodic from the re replicas of the multiples of two pi. So. So here, like, you know, this is ideal. This, this would be great. Like, let's say if you didn't do any downsampling or upsampling, if the information just passed right through, this would be ideal because we would have low, a low pass filter of low pass filter, high pass filter of high pass filter. But we get these cross terms uh, due to the aliasing, right? So these are usually the replicas of x of z that occur at omega 2 pi, okay, filtered by h naught of z. And then, and then replica at omega equals 2 pi, right? So, so what we have here is we, we, okay, so let me, 
So let's go back here. Okay. So what, we, what do we have? So we have this guy here, this g naught of z, and we have g1 of z, right? So what happens is we have whatever this response is, correct? So, so we have the low pass guy, and then he is expanded by a factor of 2. And then we have the high pass guy, and he's also expanded by a factor of 2. So what ends up happening is that what is low pass now also becomes, uh, there's a, a high pass component as well, and vice versa. So that's why we're seeing, for instance, here, what g naught of z is witnessing when we do this upsampling is we're also getting the contributions of that other replica that's feeding into it and giving us that, that high pass component. Like, what do you mean high pass component? So what's h, h naught minus z? h1 of z. Right? And, and of, and then also here, h minus z. So what, uh, sorry, x minus z. So what we're getting essentially are all these contributions that are coming over from these, these periodic replicas. And so what we want to do is we want to get rid of this, right? Right? So, okay, this is a bit befuddled. So what ends up happening is so we have this, and these guys, so from this perspective, what, uh, no. what, are, what is this guy seeing, and what is this guy seeing? So what is this guy seeing at this end? So it has low pass filter, down sample by two, now it's the entire frequency band. Then we upsample it, and we get periodic replicas. Okay? And same thing here. So this actually, let me, let me redraw this because it's looking sloppy. Oh. So here's x of z. So f0 Let me do this right. So what we have to do is we have to be careful. Oh, Z, sorry. <sighs> okay. And X, Z hat. Okay. So what ends up happening is we pass this guy through. So let's say spectrally he looks like this. And let's focus on the low pass version. So at the low pass, we're going to have him. Right? So what we're going to do is essentially high pass, low pass. So we're going to have that house looking structure. Down sample by two. What do we get? It's going to be spread out. Right? Now we up sample by two. What do we get? Replicas. Oh, sorry. No one caught that. So what ends up happening is now we get house, house, house. We basically have a subdevelopment now. Okay? And then that is what this guy sees. Right? So what happens is I want to filter this guy out, right? And take that contribution. And then here, what I would love to do is I would love to have only him and only him, such that at the end of the day, the reconstructed signal looks like that, right? Then similarly, on the high pass, it's going to be the exact same thing, uh, the high frequency component. Uh, you know, it'll be decompo decomposition, it's going to stretch, it's going to be multiple replicas when we upsample it, and then we need to filter out that. So at the end of the day, what we're going to have is essentially 
uh, that long expression here. So what we're going to have is this guy. Sorry. And we're going to have f naught g naught x of z, right? And we're going to have f1 g1 x of z, right? So this is desired, this guy here, desired. At the same time, we're going to have everything else we don't want, right? So what's going to happen is we're going to have contributions, like, you know, all these other guys, these replicas and, and such. And so what we're going to have to do is that does everything else. Okay. What do I want to happen to that? That would make me happy. So everything else, I wanted zero. Because this is ideally what I want. I basically, these guys, it's going to low pass filter, low pass filter, that component, high pass filter, high pass filter. They have that symmetry component. They're going to add together and make my original signal. Everything else that's there, bye bye. I want it to disappear. So that's what we see over here in this slide. So what we've got is if you work it all out, you're going to have these guys, and that's desired. And then you're going to have these annoying guys, and that's not desired. And, and again, that's all those aliasing terms and everything else that the system sees. We want to make this zero. It would be great. It would be great. To make H naught minus Z, G naught of Z, plus H1 minus Z, plus G1 of Z, X minus Z, I would love it to make that equal to zero, a big fat zero. So what happens is, first of all, do we have any control over the signal? No. And what happens is that doesn't play a role anyway. So what it comes down to is, can we make this guy here, these terms that cause the aliasing and replicas and all that, can we get rid of these guys? Can we set this to zero? The answer is yes. Okay? So this is where we come up with the conditions for H0, H1, G0, G1, such that at the end, these, all these terms cancel out. Right? You can see what I mean, because you have this term on one side and that term on the other. So we, let's, let's work this out a little bit, okay? So what you want to do, just like what I've written down here, you want these guys to be equal to zero. So what you can do is you can pull a little trick. So let's say what that guy, first of all, let's go into the Fourier domain instead of the Z domain. So now you've got these, all these representations are almost the same, except that the minus z is now omega minus pi, which is fine. Minus z just means we're going from low pass to high pass. We're changing. So we're uh, rotating that in frequency, which is equal to omega minus pi. Okay, so now we just made a high pass version of h naught, and then low pass version of h1. So think about, think about physically, what does that mean? So what are we doing? We're, fil we're basically taking G naught, that's a low pass filter, and we're filtering out. What are we filtering out? We're filtering out um, the, whatever portion of the high pass, uh, the stop band of the high pass filter and the signal on it. You see what I mean? So what happens when you take low pass filter and you're filtering and, and you put in cascade high pass filter? What are you doing? You're filtering out the stop band signal using your low pass signal. <sighs> like, everyone's like, huh? What? what is he talking about? This is what I'm talking about. 
So what is, yeah, what is H naught omega minus pi? It's high pass signal. It's going to look like this. Okay? From 0 to pi. What is g naught of omega? Zero to pi, correct? So what is g naught filtering in H naught? It's only filtering that. It is basically filtering the stop band region of the high uh, of of this guy. So let's suppose there's a signal here, and then it's filtering that. What I'm getting essentially is that, and at the same time, if there's any data here in, in the passband region of this filter, it's passing through the stop band region of G naught, and vice versa. So what happens is we kind of have this mismatch. We're basically trying to filter out the other guy's stop band. So what we're doing is we're getting all the stuff we don't want to pass through, right? And we know that the stop bands are not ideal. They, they actually, they're not perfectly flat. They're not perfectly zero. So a little bit of signal will propagate or percolate through this system, right? Okay. So as a result, what happens is we have this formulation using Fourier transforms. We also play around with uh, going back to H of omega. And what we find, okay, so if we have these relationships, so we want to eliminate aliasing. So what ends up happening is, let's suppose zero is not, not doable, right? Okay, or like, or let's say in addition to having that zero relationship, what we want to do is let's say the cascade of these, of okay, so let's say the cascade of the, uh, you know, low pass and low pass and high pass and high pass, what it produces at the end. So this is actually really important. So what does this guy say? What is the end result of cascading two low pass filters and two high pass filters and adding them together? They produce a delay. What this does is it produces an ideal low pass, no, an ideal all pass filter with a delay of k. That's all it says. All right? So the end-to-end -end system function of the QMF should be a delay. That's it. So essentially, you put a signal in, k units later, signal, ideal sy signal comes out. Totally not distorted. That's what QMF should do. So this, folks, is what's perfect reconstruction. The alias terms zero out. And the remaining terms, the only thing that's affecting them is a delay. That is perfect reconstruction. You have this guy, this term, this condition, and that. And that's what uh, PR is, perfect reconstruction, not public relations. Okay. <laughs> that's a different course down the hallway. So what ends up happening is if you have those conditions for alias elimination, let's, let's go into this a little bit deeper. So first of all, what is H naught of Z equal to? HZ. What is G naught of Z equal to? 2 times HZ, right? So now we know that this is 2 HZ squared. How about this? H1 and G1. This guy is going to be equal to H minus Z, and that guy is going to be equal to 2 H minus Z. So it's going to be 2 H minus Z squared. So we can take the 2 out put it to the other side. So now it's half z to the minus k. Okay? Or did I mess up? Is it the other way around? Anyways, so what happens is there should be a 2. You insert z equals uh, e to the j omega. So now we go back into the Fourier domain. And then the low-pass prototype of a two-channel QMF must satisfy this 
PR equation. So what is this equation? What does this mean? This is the equivalent to what this guy is up here. Okay? Almost. What this guy says, so actually it is. So let's say, forget about the phase. I don't want to phase shift. I don't care about delay. Wombolt magnitude distortion. What does this tell me? So let's say we take the magnitude squared of this relationship. What does this tell me? It's a constant. It's an all-pass filter, an ideal all-pass filter. If I pass a signal through the high-pass and the low-pass portions of my QMF filter bank, when I combine it at the end, I have absolutely no distortion. I just have maybe a scalar constant. I amplify it or I don't amplify it. But there's absolutely no frequency selectivity of the output signal. It's perfect. The only thing is you have a delay or a phase rotation, whatever you want to call it. If you now want to do polyphase representation, now things get complicated. Hey, this kind of looks like our friend the lattice. Okay? What ends up happening is that you can decompose H0 and H1 into polyphase representations P0 or P0 P Z to the squared and, and uh, P1 Z to the square. And you can represent these guys as low pass and high pass, and same thing at the, at the other end, the synthesis filter bank. <coughs> and what you can essentially do is have these lattice looking type structures, right? So almost identical to before with a delay. If we now bring the noble, using noble identities, we move the down sampler to the other end, we now have this guy here. So now the, we have the exact same thing as before, but now we have a lattice structure. We're using polyphase representations, and 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 we move the the, the down sampling and the up sampling to after, to be sorry before and after the polyphase filters. So what we're doing is we're actually making more efficient use of these resources, and we still have alias elimination. It's perfect, right? So what happens is, if now, do we have a process where we can design this QMF filter bank using a two-channel design? And all it is is just half-band filters. So let's say we have these half-band filters. They're zero phase, okay? And they, they have coefficients B, N, which satisfy the following, okay? That they're a constant when N is equal to zero and uh, not a constant when N is not equal to zero. So, so all even-numbered samples are 0 except for n equals 0. So this is going to help us with the polyphase representation now, right? So remember, with the polyphase representation, um, in the past, we had, let's say, non-zero coefficients at even um, time instances and zero coefficients at odd instances. And this will be great because we can take that polyphase representation when we move the decimation ahead of it. What do we get? We say bye bye to the zero coefficients. Correct? We make more efficient use of that resource. So, what happens is the zero phase implies that we have even symmetry. Okay? We also have this structure of the coefficients, meaning that all the even numbered samples okay, are zero except for n equals zero. So, we can express this frequency response by this guy. We kind of talked about this in office hours earlier today. Remember? We had that oddball thing. What happens if we had even is non-zero and odd is zero and such? Similar thing. And if it's even symmetry, we know that it's going to be now a cosine transform. So now we've got this. We have now this guy here. We have the low pass and we have the high pass versions. When we combine these two guys together and we have the discrete well, we have some sort of cosine transform, and we combine this, and we know that this guy is equal to plus or minus, sorry, minus 1 to the nth power, right? So it alternates. That's a high-pass version of this. And we combine it together, we have this guy here. So now let's, so, you know, this is sort of that little trick where if we want to create these perfect reconstruction QMF, two-channel designs, you can use these half-band filters, right? 
So let's, let's come up with these conditions. So the conditions that you need to know, and this is from Vaginathan's book, <coughs> which we talked about in lecture 28. We have low-pass prototype makes low-pass version of the QMF, and high-pass prototype, we have this guy here, which is the low-pass prototype filter, and then what happens is it's minus z to the minus 1, and we also have a delay element on top of that. And, and what we're trying to do is we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with these conditions, like in particular, to achieve that perfect reconstruction, okay? And we have that delay introduced into all of this as well, which we'll see over here. We have these delay elements as well. And this will actually yield, in this case, minus h naught minus z. And so we can use this in things like, for instance, the subband coder that we talked about, where we have subband code, uh, we have the QMF, 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 and then we do the encoding into some sort of binary representation, some code word, and then we decode and then combine using a synthesis QMF filter bank at each stage. But, okay, there's a lot of math, including this, this equation here, which Vaginathan describes pretty nicely in his book. Um, but let's say just visually, when we talked about no aliasing, what do we, what do we, like, visually, how do we see that? And it's actually, I think, this diagram does a great job. So look, like, so first of all, you have the transition at pi over 2, right? So it's evenly split based off a low-pass prototype. What's interesting about this? Look at the passband and stopband ripples. They add together, right? And what they do is they add together and make that constant. So that, that, that's one really important symmetry property, that the sum of the low-pass and high-pass contributions and magnitude responses will give you a constant right across the board. Just as a heads up, you can also make really, really interesting, not two-channel QMFs, you can make n-channel QMFs. Let the fun continue. But um, they're a little bit on the complicated side. Let's just put it that way, especially to get perfect reconstruction, right? So in uh, Ramachandran's thesis, he comes up with conditions for achieving perfect reconstruction in this setup, okay? So what you would do, okay, is you would essentially have a structure such as this. So you would have, in this case, your reconstructed signal will be essentially your original signal going in, and then you would have all the aliasing terms of the signal across all those different frequency bands, and then being filtered out by the g k of z filter, right? And then it's all summed together to create the reconstructed si signal. The only thing is, it's a little tricky, right, to, to get, let, let's say, how would you do this for M bands, right? All the stop bands, uh, the stop band ripples and pass band ripples, all superimpose and add together to give you a constant right across frequency. Very tricky. Can you make it efficient? Yes. So just like what I talked about before, you can make the H0, H1, H2, and the G0, G1, G2, all across, you can make a polyphase representation of it. All right? So what you would do is you can, first of all, take your analysis filter bank matrix. And what you can do is you can say, okay, what I want to do is, let's suppose I have H of Z. That's our polyphase matrix. So every, mm, let me see, what is this? So I believe H of Z here is equal to H1, H, uh, H0, H1, H2. So I believe each column are the coefficients of that filter, H0 of Z, H1 of Z, H2 of Z, and so on. And then the transpose means that we're actually making it row-wise. Row-wise, um, uh, each, each row, in fact, of H of Z is, 
is the set of filter coefficients for H0, H1, H2, H3. And then A of Z are the delay elements, right? So our polyphase filter, on the other hand, or a matrix, is going to be essentially all these coefficients here laid out uh, from 0 to m minus 1, 0 to m minus 1. So now what we want to do is that, and also we have our synthesis filter, and we have, again, some sort of polyphase representation. So the polyphase filter in this case for the synthesis filter is going to be Q, not P, right? Q, uh, Q matrix rather than P matrix. And so it turns out that the polyphase filters at the analysis filter, so if you take the inverse of the polyphase matrix, multiply by z to the minus k and times a constant will be equal to the synthesis polyphase matrix. So what you can do at the end of the day is if you have this cascade of delays, and you, so you take the input, take one sample, delay it by one, feed and sample, delay by one, feed and sample, delay by one, feed it into these down samplers and then pass it through the analysis uh, polyphase matrix, it will produce the exact same thing as that N analysis filter bank representation, but it will be much more computationally efficient. Because now what you've got is you've got this beautiful matrix that applies to all analysis filters, and it's just applied, it, it's applied time and time again, and your down sampling, right, is happening right before it goes into that matrix rather than after. Same thing can be said about the synthesis filter bank, all right? So as an example, and this is from your textbook, Proacus Manilakis, suppose we have a three-channel perfect reconstruction FIR QMS QMF polyphase matrix. So in this case, we have P, Z to the 3, and it's equal to this 3 by 3 matrix. My question to you is determine the analysis and synthesis filters of this QMF. And so what you would do is, first of all, your A vector would describe the progression of the delay elements. 1, z, z to the minus 1, z to the minus 2. So the information gets delayed progressively as it proceeds down every subcarrier, right? And then it passes through your poly... Uh, first of all, it gets downsampled, and then it gets passed through the polyphase matrix, and then it produces the output, right? And same thing at the other end. So, so how does this work? Well, so let's do um, a diagram. So the way this would work is as follows. So you would have your data, x of n, right? And then you would delay it by 1. And then you would delay it by 1. So let's say you get these three. Then what I do is I downsample by 3. So what does this achieve? So let's say x of n looks like this. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on, right? So what does downsampling by 3 do? You take every third sample, starting at 0, right? So you have, at the end, the 0 sample, you're going to have the um, 0, 1, 2, 3 sample. Actually, I'm, I messed up. 4, 5, 6, 6 sample, 9 sample, and so on. Now you delay by 1. So you're actually shifting the reference where you start downsampling by 1. So what you're going to end up getting is you're actually going to get sample 1, 4, at 3, 7, 10, right? And then you shift the reference by one more. I think we did this also in my office hour today, right? Like, the, like the, that trick we were doing, trying to do everything without a switch? That's it. And so now you've got 2, you've got 5, you've got 8, you've got 11. Okay? And then you pass it through your polyphase representation. So now, because before, you know, if you did not do the noble identity, you will have this sort of annoying structure. And now what we do is we save on complexity, and through the noble identity, we move that downsampling by 3 to the other side so we can get rid of this and keep things efficient. All right? 
And then at the synthesis filter bank, you do the exact same thing. But instead, you switch around the uh, upsampler and such. Okay? So in this lecture, what we saw is very briefly, like, um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I didn't go into too much detail, but there is something called, first of all, you know about quadrature mirror filter banks. But what we looked at is that the only reason why, like one of the great reasons why quadrature mirror filter banks work the way they do is because they have perfect reconstruction. So you will have at the synthesis uh, low pass and high pass filters for two channel QMF. As an example, you will have both the desired signal, which you want to stitch together to create the reconstructed signal, and all the aliasing terms. And what QMF, the way it succeeds, is that it's, it somehow eliminates through the properly chosen uh, description or uh, design of the prototype filter and how they relate to each other, they can, the aliasing terms cancel out. All right? So with that, uh, that is lecture 29. All right. So just a reminder, problem set 10.